File 21 of A Treatise of Human Nature by David Hume, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by George Yeager. Book 1, Part 3, Section 6 of the Inference from the Impression to the Idea. It is easy to observe that in tracing this relation, the inference we draw from cause to effect is not derived merely from a survey of these particular objects, and from such a penetration into their essences as may discover the dependence of the one upon the other. There is no object which implies the existence of any other if we consider these objects in themselves, and never look beyond the ideas which we form of them. Such an inference would amount to knowledge, and would imply the absolute contradiction and impossibility of conceiving anything different. But as all distinct ideas are separable, it is evident there can be no impossibility of that kind. When we pass from a present impression to the idea of any object, we might possibly have separated the idea from the impression, and have substituted any other idea in its room. It is therefore by experience only that we can infer the existence of one object from that of another. The nature of experience is this. We remember to have had frequent instances of the existence of one species of objects, and also remember that the individuals of another species of objects have always attended them, and have existed in a regular order of contiguity and succession with regard to them. Thus we remember to have seen that species of object we call flame, and to have felt that species of sensation we call heat. We likewise call to mind their constant conjunction in all past instances. Without any farther ceremony, we call the one cause and the other effect, and infer the existence of the one from that of the other. In all those instances from which we learn the conjunction of particular causes and effects, both the causes and effects have been perceived by the senses and are remembered. But in all cases wherein we reason concerning them, there is only one perceived or remembered, and the other is supplied in conformity to our past experience. Thus, in advancing, we have insensibly discovered a new relation betwixt cause and effect, when we least expected it, and were entirely employed upon another subject. This relation is their constant conjunction. Contiguity and succession are not sufficient to make us pronounce any two objects to be cause and effect unless we perceive that these two relations are preserved in several instances. We may now see the advantage of quitting the direct survey of this relation in order to discover the nature of that necessary connection which makes so essential a part of it. There are hopes that by this means we may at last arrive at our proposed end though to tell the truth, this new discovered relation of a constant conjunction seems to advance us but very little in our way. For it implies no more than this, that like objects have always been placed in like relations of contiguity and succession, and it seems evident, at least at first sight, that by this means we can never discover any new idea, and can only multiply, but not enlarge, the objects of our mind. It may be thought that what we learn not from one object, we can never learn from a hundred, which are all of the same kind, and are perfectly resembling in every circumstance. As our senses shew us in one instance two bodies 
or motions or qualities in certain relations of success and contiguity, so our memory presents us only with a multitude of instances wherein we always find like bodies, motions, or qualities in like relations. From the mere repetition of any past impression, even to infinity, there never will arise any new original idea, such as that of a necessary connection, and the number of impressions has in this case no more effect than if we confined ourselves to one only. But though this reasoning seems just and obvious, yet, as it would be folly to despair too soon, we shall continue the thread of our discourse and having found that after the discovery of the constant conjunction of any objects we always draw an inference from one object to another we shall now examine the nature of that inference and of the transition from the impression to the idea perhaps it will appear in the end that the necessary connection depends on the inference instead of the inferences depending on the necessary connection. Since it appears that the transition from an impression present to the memory or senses to the idea of an object which we call cause or effect is founded on past experience and on our remembrance of their constant conjunction, the next question is whether experience produces the idea by means of the understanding or imagination, whether we are determined by reason to make the transition, or by a certain association and relation of perceptions. If reason determined us, it would proceed upon that principle that instances of which we have had no experience must resemble those of which we have had experience and that the course of nature continues always uniformly the same in order therefore to clear up this matter let us consider all the arguments upon which such a proposition may be supposed to be founded and as these must be derived either from knowledge or probability let us cast our eye on each of these degrees of evidence and see whether they afford any just conclusion of this nature. Our foregoing method of reasoning will easily convince us that there can be no demonstrative arguments to prove that those instances of which we have had no experience resemble those of which we have had experience we can at least conceive a change in the course of nature, which sufficiently proves that such a change is not absolutely impossible. To form a clear idea of anything is an undeniable argument for its possibility, and is alone a refutation of any pretended demonstration against it. Probability, as it discovers not the relations of ideas considered as such, but only those of objects, must in some respects be founded on the impressions of our memory and senses, and in some respects on our ideas. Were there no mixture of any impression in our probable reasonings, the conclusion would be entirely chimerical and were there no mixture of ideas the action of the mind in observing the relation would properly speaking be sensation not reasoning it is therefore necessary that in all probable reasonings there be something present to the mind either seen or remembered and that from this we infer something connected with it which is not seen nor remembered the only connection or relation of objects which can lead us beyond the immediate impressions of our memory and senses is that of cause and effect, and that because it is the only one on which we can found a just inference from one object to another. The idea of cause and effect is derived from experience 
which informs us that such particular objects in all past instances have been constantly conjoined with each other and as an object similar to one of these is supposed to be immediately present in its impression we thence presume on the existence of one similar to its usual attendant according to this account of things which is i think in every point unquestionable probability is founded on the presumption of a resemblance betwixt those objects of which we have had experience and those of which we have had none and therefore it is impossible this presumption can arise from probability the same principle cannot be both the cause and effect of another and this is perhaps the only proposition concerning that relation which is either intuitively or demonstratively certain should any one think to elude this argument and without determining whether our reasoning on this subject be derived from demonstration or probability pretend that all conclusions from causes and effects are built on solid reasoning i can only desire that this reasoning may be produced in order to be exposed to our examination it may perhaps be said that after experience of the constant conjunction of certain objects we reason in the following manner such an object is always found to produce another it is impossible it could have this effect if it was not endowed with a power of production the power necessarily implies the effect and therefore there is a just foundation for drawing a conclusion from the existence of one object to that of its usual attendant the past production implies a power the power implies a new production and the new production is what we infer from the power and the past production it were easy for me to shew the weakness of this reasoning were i willing to make use of those observations i have already made that the idea of production is the same with that of causation and that no existence certainly and demonstratively implies a power in any other object or were it proper to anticipate what i shall have occasion to remark afterwards concerning the idea we form of power and efficacy but as such a method of proceeding may seem either to weaken my system by resting one part of it on another or to breed a confusion in my reasoning i shall endeavour to maintain my present assertion without any such assistance it shall therefore be allowed for a moment that the production of one object by another in any one instance implies a power and that this power is connected with its effect but it having been already proved that the power lies not in the sensible qualities of the cause and there being nothing but the sensible qualities present to us i ask why in other instances you presume that the same power still exists merely upon the appearance of these qualities your appeal to past experience decides nothing in the present case and at the utmost can only prove that that very object which produced any other was at that very instant endowed with such a power but can never prove that the same power must continue in the same object or collection of sensible qualities much less that a like power is always conjoined with like sensible qualities should it be said that we have experience that the same power continues united with the same object and that like objects are endowed with like powers i would renew my question why from this experience we form any conclusion beyond those past instances of which we have had experience if you answer this question in the same manner as the preceding 
your answer gives still occasion to a new question of the same kind, even in infinitum, which clearly proves that the foregoing reasoning had no just foundation. Thus, not only our reason fails us in the discovery of the ultimate connection of causes and effects, but even after experience has informed us of their constant conjunction, it is impossible for us to satisfy ourselves by our reason why we should extend that experience beyond those particular instances which have fallen under our observation. We suppose but are never able to prove that there must be a resemblance betwixt those objects of which we have had experience and those which lie beyond the reach of our discovery. We have already taken notice of certain relations which make us pass from one object to another, even though there be no reason to determine us to that transition and this we may establish for a general rule that wherever the mind constantly and uniformly makes a transition without any reason it is influenced by these relations now this is exactly the present case reason can never shew us the connection of one object with another though aided by experience and the observation of their constant conjunction in all past instances when the mind therefore passes from the idea or impression of one object to the idea or belief of another it is not determined by reason but by certain principles which associate together the ideas of these objects and unite them in the imagination had ideas no more union in the fancy than objects seem to have to the understanding we could never draw any inference from causes to effects nor repose belief in any matter of fact the inference therefore depends solely on the union of ideas the principles of union among ideas i have reduced to three general ones and have asserted that the idea or impression of any object naturally introduces the idea of any other object that is resembling contiguous to or connected with it these principles i allow to be neither the infallible nor the sole causes of an union among ideas they are not the infallible causes for one may fix his attention during some time on any one object without looking farther they are not the sole causes for the thought has evidently a very irregular motion in running along its objects and may leap from the heavens to the earth from one end of the creation to the other without any certain method or order but though i allow this weakness in these three relations and this irregularity in the imagination yet i assert that the only general principles which associate ideas are resemblance contiguity and causation there is indeed a principle of union among ideas which at first sight may be esteemed different from any of these but will be found at the bottom to depend on the same origin when every individual of any species of objects is found by experience to be constantly united with an individual of another species the appearance of any new individual of either species naturally conveys the thought to its usual attendant thus because such a particular idea is commonly annexed to such a particular word nothing is required but the hearing of that word to produce the correspondent idea and it will scarce be possible for the mind by its utmost efforts to prevent that transition in this case it is not absolutely necessary 
that upon hearing such a particular sound we should reflect on any past experience and consider what idea has been usually connected with the sound the imagination of itself supplies the place of this reflection and is so accustomed to pass from the word to the idea that it interposes not a moment's delay betwixt the hearing of the one and the conception of the other but though i acknowledge this to be a true principle of association among ideas i assert it to be the very same with that betwixt the ideas of cause and effects and to be an essential part in all our reasonings from that relation we have no other notion of cause and effect but that of certain objects which have been always conjoined together and which in all past instances have been found inseparable we cannot penetrate into the reason of the conjunction. We only observe the thing itself, and always find that from the constant conjunction the objects acquire an union in the imagination. When the impression of one becomes present to us, we immediately form an idea of its usual attendant, and consequently we may establish this as one part of the definition of an opinion or belief, that it is an idea related to or associated with a present impression. Thus, though causation be a philosophical relation as implying contiguity, succession, and constant conjunction, yet it is only so far as it is a natural relation and produces an union among our ideas that we are able to reason upon it or draw any inference from it end of file twenty one